and it's verses 11 to 12 and 19 to 26. So that's Mark 11, 11 to 12 and 19 to 26. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple area. After looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry, and seeing from a distance a fig tree, he went to see if it was, um, if it perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. And whenever evening came, they would leave the city as they were passing by in the morning. They saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, who heaven says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, mm -hmm. and they will be granted to you. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, who is in heaven, will also forgive you for your offences. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, who is in heaven, forgive your offences. Amen. Amen. Father God, as um, we listen to Paul this morning, I pray an extra special blessing upon him, Father. Fill him with your Holy Spirit, Lord, right now, and let him be blessed. And Father, I pray that that blessing will bless each and every one of us, that your words will be spoken today. Thank you, Father. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, um, I um, not too long ago preached on this um, story, less than two years ago, I think. And um, when I was preparing it, I thought, shall I skip this one? Uh, you know, I've been doing a, a series of miracles from Mark. And this was the last story, the last miracle. Um, and I thought, shall I skip this one? And uh, because I, I, less than two years ago, I actually spoke on this uh, scripture. But I just sense, no, uh, you know, you're here now, Paul, do it. And uh, so I kind of cherry-picked my old notes and then binned them and, uh, and then just come together before the Lord and, and prepared for you today what is, what is here. Um, and at the end of this uh, service, I'm going to be declaring a declaration and it's called Session 2. Uh, those of you who were here when I did Session 1 regarding speaking your body well uh, using scripture and declaration medicine. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today <coughs> uh, Declaration Session 2, which is speaking your spirit well. So if you haven't seen Chapter 1, it's on the internet so you can... Just go and have a look and see. Uh, you, it's worthwhile you seeing one because it gives a fuller explanation. Today I want to give a working practice principle for the session two because you know, I have found, as I applied it to myself, that um, it's been tremendously beneficial. And uh, there are all sorts of people uh, in this world at the moment who are dying, mm -hmm. uh, who I know personally uh, in different ways, are using this medicine uh, to uh, keep them alive and uh, even this morning we had an email to say someone who was should have been dead a year ago 
is still there, Amen. still with us. And um, so um, this works, yeah. and I encourage you to do it. And I said to Rob the other day, because um, I have the privilege of doing this, I can recall myself, I've discovered that using your own voice is the best voice you need to hear. So the thing to do is to get a worksheet copy for me, read it on a some kind of recording system, listen to yourself read, and play it every day. It takes two, three, four minutes every day, and, and go through it, declaring it with yourself, the revelation of the scriptures that we're going to hear today, and that session one contains as well. But I don't want to skip the factor as it relates to Mark and the fig tree and Jesus and stuff. So here we go. Now, while they were walking to Jerusalem, Jesus got hungry. Now, the man Jesus experienced everything we experience. And I know that it's hard for us to truly, really, really imagine that that is true. But it is. The Bible teaches us that he was tempted in every way, meaning he had the same possibility of doing wrong that we have. The difference with Jesus was he never did, but he could have, but he never did. He was the one that was positioned as the second Adam, and as Adam had the freedom to sin and did, so Jesus had the freedom to sin and didn't. And it was because of the didn't factor in Jesus' life that everything that we've received by way of a blessing is possible. Had Jesus done it, or been a did it, then we wouldn't have got it. And we would all be destined to an eternity for a judgment to come. But he did not do those things that Adam did. And that's why we have this incredible victory in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. But he was tempted in every way, but did not choose to go along with that temptation. Jesus inquired as he's making his way, being hungry, sees the fig tree. He inquires, and, he, and he's, the, the Mark declares, if perhaps there were figs on the tree, perhaps there were figs on the tree. And you can see from Jesus' apprehension in the word perhaps, he is not convinced he will find any figs on the fig tree. Even though he wants to find some because Jesus is hungry. And hunger is a desire. And human beings are driven by desires. And the manipulator of all human beings uses desires to entice us into wrongdoing. But Jesus, though he had this desire for food, he sees the fig tree, it does not provide him sustenance, and as a result, he is still hungry. So Jesus is hungry. Jesus found on this fig tree what he was expecting to find. <coughs> no figs. He knew that there wasn't any, which is why he said, perhaps he may find figs, but there was none. And in himself, Jesus knew that he wouldn't find any. Because his Noah knew. And when you become a Christian, your spirit comes alive. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside your spirit. And he is the voice of your spirit, your voice of your inner heart. And, it, and he gives you the knowing that you know something. The reason why we know we have salvation is because we have a thing called assurance working in us. Now that, the voice of that assurance is Holy Spirit. He is the assurance, Paul says, the pledge, the, the mark of ownership upon us who believe, who have come to sincere repentance. So Jesus knows in his Noah that there's no figs 
of the fig tree. But he says of himself, perhaps he may well find some. But actually, he discovers exactly what he already knew. So he says to the fig tree, Jesus speaks to trees. Yes, <laughs> Jesus talks to trees and to everything. Jesus speaks to everything because that is how they were created. That's the everything that's included and incorporated in the everything that exists has come into existence on the basis of him speaking to it to live. It was by the word that God brought the world into being. So God in Jesus spoke and all these things came into being. Yes, Jesus speaks to everything because that is how they were created. God said and God in Jesus is now speaking to the fig tree. He said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. His words spoken out killed the life in the fig tree. The fig tree died at that point. Now, when he says, um, no one will ever, so the word ever means forever. So that's forever in eternity. There's never going to be a place for that fig tree in eternity or any aspect of the life of that fig tree in eternity. So when he says forever, he means for always. And one of the great commissions that we have been um, instructed with is to be those who proclaim to the lost mm. who are going into the forever encounter separation from God. The same place that the fig tree has gone to. And we need to be mindful of the truths that relate to the forever reality. And so when we see the word no one will ever is because that means forever. No one will ever eat from you fix because you are going to die. God who said in Genesis to the mother of that fig tree along with all other vegetation in Genesis, live, was now saying to that same fig tree, generations on, die. So when God speaks his word, it has life in it to do whatever God says he would do. Mm. And our confidence and faith in the gospel is built on the message of the word of God. There is not another human being that you want to listen to more than you want to listen to the Word of God. Because the Word of God is where the creative life exists. Mm. It's true that human beings have the potential for creative life for the negative and the positive, but we won't get distracted by that today. So this fig tree dies. Now on their way back, into town the next day so there was no thunderbolt from heaven it, he just spoke the word and the fig tree looked exactly the same as it would have looked but they're off they're down to Jerusalem and then they come back the next day on the next day back into town the next day Peter points out the fig tree to Jesus it died as he said in the night it had withered from the root up. It had withered from the root up. So the death curse that Jesus pronounced on the fig tree brought about the end of the life in the fig tree. But it took the night to go on a journey to enable the reality of what was to be seen by Peter as he acknowledged the dead fig tree. But there was a period of from that time when he spoke to that time when the reality of what he spoke 
came into being. And Peter points it out and points it out to Jesus. And we need to remember that when God speaks, he speaks to the problem, not to the fruit of the problem. <coughs> and so he spoke to the root, not the fruit. When God sets captives free, that's you and I, God speaks to the root, mm. not the fruit. Sins are a problem because they are the fruit of sin. And sin exists in us because we were born with a sinful nature, thanks to Adam. God has given us the opportunity to resolve the issue regarding that contention with himself in Jesus. And those who have put their trust in Jesus for salvation have rebirthed, born again, the spirit reality of who they are in God. And they are now as Adam was before Adam sinned. So they have been restored to the fullness of all that God had for Adam. Now the fulfilment of that reality is a journey into glory. But nevertheless, the essence of that reality is the same as what Jesus passed when he spoke to the fig tree that night. And it took the night to get to the day before Peter saw the reality of what Jesus had done. So Jesus, God, deals with the root to destroy the fruit. And unless you deal with the root of sin in our lives, you will keep on producing the fruit of sin in our lives. And notice I said there, our lives. Because we are all sinners. Mm -hmm. Being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So we are on a journey of transformation and change. So we need to realise that there is a journey to go on. If we don't understand the process in which God brings about the sinlessness in us, or sinless in us, then we won't really understand what it is that God is doing by way of the process of transforming us. You need to know that God deals with the root in order to deal with the fruit. Many Christians spend their lives pruning the fruit out of their lives and get nowhere, except what Freud called suppressed unrighteousness. There's a suppression of the desire to do the wrong thing. And if you want to get a scriptural kind of reflection on that, look at Romans 7. I don't do the things I ought, instead I find myself doing the things I ought not to do. If I'm finding myself doing the things I ought not to do, it demonstrates that it's not me doing them, that sin which indwells me. Wretched man, says Paul, that I am. Who will set? And it's Christ who sets us free. So there's this tension between understanding how God deals with the wrong in our lives. And until it gets to the root, we keep on producing the fruit. And that's why you often see so many people never change. It doesn't matter how many times you cut back the fruit from the tree, God knows the only way to solve the problem of sin in us is to die. Unless a grain of seed falls in the ground and die, it cannot bear new fruit. We need to die to self and live for God. And the way we die is surrender to God. Not my will, Jesus in the garden. Not my will, but your will be done, Father. Jesus did not want to go to the cross when he was in Gethsemane. But he called out. The anguish on him, he sweat drops of blood. That's the intensity of the desire within him not to go. And yet, in the end, he surrenders to the Father. And that's why Paul says it by, 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 by um, obedience to the Father, that the demonstration of the reality of who Jesus is, is, is exalted in heaven. He who was God did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself. That's Jesus. That's our Saviour. So, my old minister, who used to be here, recently just died, Arthur, and we had a wonderful service when we went to his funeral, Thanksgiving service. And I had a lot of respect for Arthur. 
And, uh, but he preached a sermon once, and he, and he called this grubbing out the root. Mm. Grubbing out the root. And you have to grub out the root to deal with the problem so that you stop bearing fruit. Grub out the root. Deal with the issue that's causing the problem, and then you solve the problem. Grub out the root. You have to curse sin at the root. And that is what Jesus did at the cross. So now, because of Jesus, we can bring all he did for us at the cross and overcome the problem of sin. So there's no such thing as we couldn't do it anymore. We can do the right thing now because God has repositioned us to live in Romans chapter 8 as a child of God. We can live in the reality of chapter 8. We don't have to hang around chapter 7 of Romans too much. So, when God declared in Mark chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, have faith in God, therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. Now that's either true or it's a lie. I have chosen to be persuaded that it's true. That what Jesus said in, in verse 24 is true. And that's scripture medicine. Now, in order for that to work, we need to apply every facet of insight that God gives us regarding bringing that into being. And that's what this service today message is about. Have faith in God, it says in verse 23. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. There's some conditions there. All things are possible for him who believes. Jesus is talking this. All things are possible for him who believes. He is presenting, Jesus is presenting to us another spiritual law. And he is inviting us to trust and believe in what he is saying. Any disciple, anyone who wants to read the scripture, they can apply the reality of this. If they believe it, they can enter into it, to the fullness of all that God has made through it. It is available to them who believe. Now, if you do believe, it will benefit your life. If you don't believe, it won't benefit your life. Even though it's there, even though it's penned, even though it's available, that you have to meet the criteria, conditions of God, spiritual law, in order to be able to enter into the fullness of everything he wants us to enter into. Believing connects us to God's blessings. Mm -hmm. Unbelieving or unbelief disconnects us from his blessings. Satan wants each of us to listen to anything other than what God has said. Anything other than what God has said. And because of the new tree of life that we have, the tree of knowledge of good and evil that we have in the world today, people go to Google. And they find from Google, good and bad. And that good and bad brings incredible confusion. But we need to be those as Christians who go to the Word of God, Amen. which is the tree of life Amen. and truth. Amen. Until we learn to believe and trust in the Bible, and what God has to say right. more than anyone else, right. more than anything else, we are on a losing journey. Yeah. We will never get there. But as soon as we invest our faith in the Bible, in the Word of God, we have set our face towards an adventure, an excitement of life mm -hmm. that will absolutely transform us in ourselves and in the world in which we live in yeah. and the blessings that will come as a result of walking that way is going to be incredible mm. 
If we don't ask him, you won't get from him. But if you ask without believing, you can't get from him. So there are those who don't ask and they don't get. But there are those that do ask but don't actually have faith in his word and as a result they don't get either. What God wants to do is take every Christian on a journey of trusting in his word to bring about all of the blessings just like we got the blessing of salvation. God wants to bring about all of the blessings that the Bible has promised us from the Father. He wants us to enter in to the fullness of his glory. Hebrews 4. They did not enter in because of unbelief. But God wants us to be believing. Now we've already stepped into that whole realm of faith in trusting in God for salvation. Because there is no one in this room that can prove that they're going to be saved. But by faith, mm -hmm. your Noah knows you are saved. You can't explain it, but you know it's true. And that's because you are fully persuaded and convinced by the word promised to whoever it was that shared the gospel with you. As it is for salvation, for the unrepentant, so it is for everything else in his kingdom. Those who never turn to God miss out on their salvation. And the lost truly will be saved if they don't repent. And that is very sad. Because <coughs> they don't have to miss out. They could be saved. But they're not saved unless they repent. But those who don't ask God with Bible believing faith will also miss out on what they ask for also. God won't bring them into the blessing they need because he requires us to apply the spiritual law that needs to be applied in regards to receiving from him the things that he has promised. Therefore I say to you, all things are possible, those who pray and believe. And we need to be of those who have invested in Mark 11, 23 and 24. Some of the laws, some of the laws have other conditions, like giving. The law of giving applies. Don't think that God will bless you if you don't tithe or give to his kingdom financially. God requires that we give to him. We sow. Malachi tells us to sow in order to reap. Now God doesn't need your money, despite what you might think. God is perfectly <coughs> amply able to supply all of his needs according to his riches and glory. What God gets when you step out in faith and learn to be a generous giver, God gets your trust because you've given to him and he can give back to you with blessing. So you have to learn to live and trust him for 90% of whatever and your 90% will go further than your 100%. That's the law of the kingdom. It's the upside down kingdom. But that's how it works. But if you never give, you'll never see what it's like to see God provide for you. But when you, when you, when you give, then you'll see. That's why I don't waste my time having collections and all sorts. Because our trust is in God. Yes. Amen. And if God has got your heart, he's got your money. What belongs to you? What belongs to you? Nothing belongs to you. We are all guardians, whether they be children or, or stuff. It's all God's. When we learn to understand those principles, it's a spiritual law. But don't get distracted. And forgiveness is the same. You know, if, you, if you've got hatred in your heart for someone, you, 
you come to God and say, forgive me for what I've just done. Mm -hmm. right? God's going to say to you, because you're knowable conviction, if you've got anything going on in your heart, God will say to you, yeah, I forgive you, but you forgive that person now. And we say, well, you know, I don't think I forgive them. I mean, they, you know, they, they were extra nasty to me. <laughs> and God says, well, when, 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 you know, when, you've, when you've dealt with that, then I can forgive you. You won't find it. If you give the devil a foothold, the devil will come in. The devil will take charge of you. If you live with resentment, if you live with hatred, if you live with bitterness, bitterness, you're poisoning yourself. God won't share your heart with those things. There's a spiritual law to apply in regards to forgiveness. There's a spiritual law in regards to asking, which is what Mark 11, 23 is all about. About the principle of believing without doubt. Knowing that you've already received. So that you learn to thank before you even get it. Just like Peter cursed, just like Jesus cursed the fig tree in the night. And then the fig tree was alive still. It didn't look like it was dead. But by the morning, it had died because it processed itself into death. And that's how God brings about the transformation changes in our lives. Jesus said, I will, it will be granted to him. Do you believe what Jesus said is true? Why are we so willing to believe the lies about God, but not so willing to believe the truth? I had someone say to me today, I heard something this week, said to me, my uh, dad killed himself. And it, it really disturbed me, which of course it would. And then she said, and I just dropped God. And I said, why, why are you blaming God? Mm. Why are you blaming God mm. for that? Who, who, how is it God's fault? Mm. And she said, well, you know, if he has a God, he would. I said, well, well I've studied the Bible for 50 years. There is nowhere in the Bible where God promises anything like that with regards to, um, you know, m removing individual issues from people, or, you know, unless we ask him. Unless, you know, did your dad ask? You know, there's a, there's a sense in which people are quite happy to blame God. Yeah. Put it at God's door. That's right. It's not God. Why does God get all the blame? Yeah. Yeah, right. Why is God getting all the blame? It's not God. God is a good God. I've read the Bible. Yeah. It's taken me 50 years. I've read the Bible last time. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible is, is, is the Food for the spiritual person. Yeah. Jesus said it would be granted to him. The word of God is the foundation of our faith. So walk in the light of his word. Yeah. This means stand on the truth that his word has revealed to us. If you've got an issue or a problem or something and you can't find a scripture for what you're asking for, I mean, don't ever ask God to win the lottery. He's not going to give you the numbers. Oh. He doesn't do that. Nowhere in the scripture does he say he's going to do that. Yeah. You know, God is not going to, God is not going to um, curse your enemy. I mean, there's a, David had a bit of a go at that, but I'm not getting there. But, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense in which in the new covenant, just to qualify that, God is not going to going to be your, as it were, your, your, your sword to destroy your enemy. God says, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. His, his management of all these things are different. Yeah. If you can't find a scripture for what you're asking for, stop asking. <coughs> because you need the scripture to authenticate the, the possibility of believing in the word to ask. God will not give you what he hasn't said. And that's what this girl wanted from her dad dying. If you can't authenticate it with scripture, stop asking for it. If it hasn't, if he hasn't said it, then we have no foundation to stand on on the journey of faith. Bible faith comes from hearing the word of God. Saying it is so in it. Saying it is so in it. It's the opportunity to become fully persuaded. Because when you say it, all of the enemies in your against your faith in you will raise their head. Doubt, fear, uncertainty, questions, 
past disappointments. They're going to raise their head. And it's that that needs to be destroyed. God, God's will is to build strong disciples who will trust his word, Jesus. And that's the same person. Trust his word. It's not his word and Jesus. It's trust his word. Jesus is God's word. The word became flesh. Jesus is God's word. Trust God's word, Jesus, who takes a whole victorious gospel to a broken world. God is wanting to so faithfully inspire us mm. that we have something worth offering to a broken world. Right. Solutions to the problems in Jesus' name. Mm. Sin, sinfulness is a hindrance of faith. Unforgiveness is sin. <laughs> it will separate you from your confidence in God's blessing. Don't let anything get in the way of God's blessings for you. Jesus said, Satan, he has nothing in me. 2 Corinthians 16, 16, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Only let God live in you. Your own spirit knows when you have done the right thing. And it knows also when you've done the wrong thing. His conviction in spirit leads you to sincere repentance, leads us to sincere repentance and the opportunity of release from the burden of guilt and shame. The battle we are in is against fear, doubt and unbelief. We to have faith in the truth of what God has said in his word. The man in Mark 9 said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. And there is that place of uncertainty, even though we have set our hands to the plow. We have to work these things out of us so that we are freed from them to anticipate God's blessings upon us. Because the spiritual law is we can't get until we believe without doubt, with thanksgiving. Fruit will grow if you trust in his word and believe when you ask of him. So that's the end of the sermon. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so my assumption is that you have already watched session one, Calling My Body Well, and have gained insight into the justification as to why we can do what I am revealing to, you, to us today in session two. So this is session two, and this is calling your spirit well with medicine from God's word. Isaiah chapter 66, 1 and 2. God has made his home in our spirit. Keep your spirit well by speaking God's words of recovery. Confessing God's word to your spirit to keep my spirit working the way he created it before sin came in. God is my healer. God is my deliverer. God is my strength. God sent his word into the world to save the world. John 3.17 By his wounds I am healed. 1 Peter 2.24 Confess to your inner spirit we're not trying to convince others my spirit is well, but to become fully persuaded myself in all that I am now. I will become highly developed in my faith in his word. I call my spirit well according to Mark 11, 23 and 24. Have faith in God. 23, 24, 
Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe you have received them, and they will be granted to you. Say these scripture declaration medicines out loud. 1 Peter 2.24 By his wounds I am healed. By his wounds I am healed. By his wounds I am healed. Psalm 107.20 Say out loud. He sent his word and healed me. He sent his word and healed me. He sent his word and healed me. God's words has creative life in it. So breathe in the breath of the scripture, declaration medicine, and speak out its creative life. Saying it is sowing it. Saying his word sends our faith in this word off to work. But unless we sow it, it won't grow. So I call my spirit well as if it were each of these confessions. I am not speaking the things, I am speaking the things that are not as if they were until they are. Declare this confession, medicine, out loud. And these are the medicine drops, if you like. Jesus said, whoever says to this mountain, be removed. So, I call you, my spirit, to take charge of everything that is within me. I call you, my spirit, to bring all that I am into God's incredible blessings. I call you, my spirit, to forgive everyone that has hurt you. I call you, my spirit, to receive release from guilt of those you have hurt. I call you, my spirit, free from all lies and deceptions that you have believed. I call you, my spirit, to let go of every enemy that has befriended you. I call you, my spirit, to open up your eyes to see the will of God for you. I call you, my spirit, to open up your ears to hear every word spoken by God. I call you, my spirit, to believe and trust the voice of the Holy Spirit. I call you, my spirit, to welcome God's Holy Spirit into every part of you. Grow in your conviction of your faith in God's word declared. Your intention <coughs> is to become fully persuaded by your declarations so that you are free from unbelief, fear, guilt, shame and doubt. It is by your confession you will receive your spirit healing. Mm -hmm. What, we've just come and finished with I'll try. <laughs> well, Father God, we just thank you for. Uh, I want to thank you for Paul mm. and uh, and his love for you and his heart for you and this desire mm. to see healing in people and yes. and just 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 to bring you mm. and who you are into the lives of us and the people around us. So we just thank you for that Lord. Thank you for the incredible healing power that are in your words and this this, this thing and I also want to uh, just repent and ask forgiveness for my for my doubts and my not unbelief but just 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 that oh, really yeah. kind of feeling yeah. And replace that with yes, Lord. That my Noah does know. Yeah. My Amen. Noah does know yes. that you are 
yeah. who you say you are. Right. Your word yeah. does yeah. what your Jesus. word says it yeah. does. Yeah. And we give you thanks you and glory for that. Thank you for this uh, Thank you. this declaration that yes. Paul's brought here today. Yeah. And that, you know, that we do take it, record it and use it and, and benefit and gain all that you want to give us as a result of it. Yes. We just thank Great. you for all you Great. did for us on the cross, for making you, all of this mm. possible mm. for us. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.